This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. I read an article recently that indicated that of the major U.S. religious traditions, most of them now allow for women to become preachers. A man named Christian Piat has an article published on faithstreet.com in which he states that many of today's Christian seminaries have as many women as men. That is, out of those studying to be ministers, those studying to be preachers, he says there are as many women as there are men. He then lists five reasons why he says churches need a female preacher. Not just to be fair, but he says they need this. And we're being told today that the restrictions in the Bible against women preaching and against women being leaders in the church, we're being told that those were merely cultural issues and they have no bearing on us today. Friends, clearly there has been a change in this country and, and in the world in the last several years with regard to the role of women in the church. In fact, some people would even go so far as to argue that the Bible actually downplays women and degrades and demeans women. The well-known actress Amanda Donahoe once starred in a movie entitled Lair of the White Worm in which her character spits on a crucifix. Now, commenting on that scene, she said, spitting on Christ was a great deal of fun especially for me, a woman. I can't embrace a male God who has persecuted sexuality throughout the ages. Friends, for the next several minutes, we're going to be studying these questions. What does the Bible really say about the role of women? Can women serve today as preachers and elders and leaders in the church? Are the restrictions in the Bible merely cultural issues that died off a long time ago? And does God, does the Bible really persecute and demean women? Dear friend, as we begin this study, I want to suggest to you that if a person will honestly examine the Bible, he will not find women being downgraded or demeaned or persecuted by God. The truth is, he'll find just the opposite of that. If you open your Bible to the book of Genesis, you'll find God say, it is not good that man should be alone, Genesis 2.18. And so he created the woman. And so from the very beginning, we find woman being created by God to make a good situation out of one that was not good. You come over to the book of Proverbs and it says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, Proverbs 18.22. You get to the end of the book and, and the proverb writer says about the virtuous woman, her worth is far above rubies, Proverbs 31 and verse 10. Verse 28 says, Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. And so when a person looks at the Bible, what he finds is God having an exalted view of women. You see, a godly woman is set on a pedestal. She is considered to be a great blessing. Okay, going forward, I want to examine the role of women in three different areas. Number one, I want to talk about the role of women in the world. Number two, we're going to talk about the role of women in the marriage relationship. And finally, where we're going to spend most of our time relates to the role of women in the church. All right, point number one, let's talk about the role of the woman in the world. Now, I could spend a lot of time on this, but I just want to make a, a very few remarks with regard to this topic. I want us to contrast the way the world views the role of the woman as opposed to the way God views the role of the woman. First, let's think about the behavior of the woman. What, what should the behavior of a woman be like? The world puts forth the idea that the woman's behavior should be provocative and irreverent. You see this type of thing on television all the time that uh, a woman's demeanor is sassy and, and sexual. Now, contrast that with what the Bible says. The Lord says, pure and respectful, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 2. Now, sassy and sexual contrasted with pure and respectful? You see, you're not going to hear a godly woman using lewd and offensive humor. You're not going to see a godly woman smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol. Well, what about the dress of a woman? How should she clothe herself? 
Now again, the world says sexy. The clothing industry pushes this. The, the clothing that is in vogue for women is that which men will find enticing. Now, in contrast to that, the Lord says modest, 1 Timothy 2.9. Now, think about that, sexy versus modest. The Bible says chaste and discreet, Titus chapter 2 and verse 5. Well, what about a woman's speech? How should she talk? The world says you make sure everyone can hear you. The feminist movement says, I am woman, hear me roar. Now, listen to the marked contrast of God. The Bible says, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. 1 Peter 3 and verse 4. A gentle and a quiet spirit. Why, that sounds strange for our world, doesn't it? Now, I could say a great deal more about this point, but what I'm trying to communicate is that the world is very mixed up about what a woman should be. And so if the world is setting our standards, then we're going to have big problems. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, point number two. Let's talk about the role of woman in the marriage relationship. Now, before I begin this point, let me mention that what the Bible has to say about this subject is not well received in the world in which we live. You know, we live in a society of political correctness. And what the Bible has to say about this subject is not considered politically correct. In fact, it's very counterculture. But dear friend, we must never allow the world or political correctness or the fear of offending someone else, or, or anything for that matter, take precedent over doing what's right. Okay, what does the Bible say about the role of the woman in the marriage relationship? Here it is, Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. Verse 24, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 3, 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Now, notice the word, submissive. Wives, likewise, be submissive. Now, submissive to whom? He says, to her own husband. Some in the feminist movement today will march because they say they don't want to be in submission or be in subjection to men. But here, Peter doesn't say that women are to be in submission to all men. Rather, he says that a woman is to be in submission to her own husband. Now, somebody else says, well, you know, I would be in submission or I would be in subjection to my husband if he were the right kind of husband. But here, Peter is talking about an unbeliever. This is a Christian woman married to an unbelieving husband. Notice, Peter says, even if some do not obey the word. Now, certainly, if a husband is not faithful to the Lord, he's not the right kind of husband. But still, the Christian wife is to be in subjection to him. Now, does that mean that the woman is inferior to her husband? No, it certainly doesn't mean that. In fact, listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Paul wrote, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now notice he says, the head of Christ is God. Now does that mean that one member of the Godhead is inferior to another? No, it doesn't mean that. Christ and God are equal. But Jesus made himself in submission to the will of the Father. You know, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 talks about that. In fact, Christ submitted himself all the way to the cross. And then when it talks about the fact that a woman is to submit to her husband, that doesn't mean that she is inferior to him. But it does mean that she has a different role. She is faithfully fulfilling her role as a God-given wife when she submits to her husband. Now, does this mean that a woman is less valuable in the eyes of God than is a man? No, it certainly doesn't mean that. Does it mean that a woman is less spiritual? Again, it doesn't mean that. Many times, women are more spiritually minded than are men. Does this mean that women are not as intelligent as men? 
No, in fact, sometimes a wife might be considerably smarter than is her husband. Well, if that's the case, if the wife is smarter than her husband, should she then take the lead in her family? Should she become the, the head of the household? No. The role that she has and the role that he has are both God-given. They are assigned by the Lord. And we have no right to try to switch around these roles because of our individual circumstances. Now somebody says, well, what about Galatians chapter 3 and verse 28? It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And they'll argue, you see, the text says there is neither male nor female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And friends, that's true, we are all equal in Christ, but still we hold different roles. You know, this, this feminist movement in the United States over the last 40 or 50 years, I think has done a great deal of harm to our country. It's, it's done harm to the country and, and to the home and, and to the family and even to the Lord's church. And I would caution you against it because its end is evil. I heard a story about a woman who got on a bus one day after work and she was with all of her co-workers who were men and she looked at one of them and she said, won't you give a lady your seat? Because all the seats were filled. And the man looked at her and he said, Woman, let me tell you something. You work like a man. You dress like a man. You smoke like a man. You cuss like a man. You can stand like a man. Now friends, that's the end result of the feminist movement. It degrades women. It pulls her down from the pedestal that God puts her on. The Lord puts a woman in a position that is honored. But you see, the world puts her in a position that God never intended for it to be. What is the role of the woman in the marriage relationship and in the home? Titus chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 says that she is to love her children. She is to be a keeper of the home. The New King James says a homemaker. And she is to be obedient to her own husband. Okay, point number three. Let's talk about the role of women in the church. Can a woman serve as a preacher? Can she serve as an elder? Can she be one of the leaders of the church? You know, these are questions that have been at the forefront of many discussions in recent years. And some people are saying, the church has been wrong about this. We need to stop holding women back and we need to tap into their talents and allow them to be leaders of God's people. In fact, many, if not most, modern denominations have embraced female leadership in their churches. So what really matters and what we really want to know is what does God say about this? What does the Bible say in answer to these questions? Now, I want to begin in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The book of 1 Timothy is a book that explains how we are to behave ourselves in the church. And that's our topic, the role of women in the church. A key passage is 1 Timothy 3.15. The Apostle Paul writes, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, now listen, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so Paul is writing to Timothy to tell him how to behave himself, how to conduct affairs in the church. Now again, that's our topic. We're talking about the role of women in the church. Now with that in mind, I want us to consider 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul writes that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now the word here for men, the Greek word is a word that means mankind. It means all of humanity. That is, prayers should be made for all of humanity. Then in verse 4, he says that God will have all men to be saved. Again, this is the Greek word that means humanity all of humanity. God wants all of mankind to be saved. Then in verse 5 he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Again, the word here for men is mankind. There is one mediator between God and humanity, mankind. Well, then we get to verse 8 and he writes, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now this word is not the same word that we have seen previously referring to men. That means mankind. This is not the word for humanity. 
Rather, this is the word that refers to males, that prayers be made by males. And so what we learn from this passage is that when a group of Christians is gathered together and both men and women are present, a man, a male Christian, is to lead that prayer. Now, sometimes people will ask the question, can a woman pray publicly? Now, that's not really a good question because, of course, she can pray publicly. In fact, she must pray publicly. When we pray together, all Christians are involved in praying to God, and, and so certainly a woman is praying. But the question is, can she lead a public prayer? And the answer to that is no. But there's a second thing that I want us to notice from verse number 8, and that is the phrase, everywhere. Men are to pray everywhere. The American Standard says, every place. Now this is an extremely important phrase because it tells us something about the context of our discussion. Now, does this phrase, everywhere, or this phrase, every place, have limitations? Frank Young wrote about this passage. He said, in first century usage, this particular Greek word that's translated as place, he said, referred to a meeting place. He said, thus the force of this passage is to limit prayer in a general assembly. Bobby Liddell wrote, the setting of which Paul writes in his apostolic authority is everywhere and certainly includes and is in fact a specific reference to the public assembly of the church. The great scholar Guyan Woods wrote about this section of scripture. It seems clear to me that the context is with reference to public devotions. A correct exegesis of this phrase in every place must be understood to mean in every place where public worship is engaged. And you know, if this passage did not have reference to the public assembly but actually referred to every place, then we would have a passage teaching that only males can pray. And certainly, that's not what he's saying. And so, the context is that of a public assembly of Christians gathered together. Now, someone might ask, why are you putting so much emphasis on this? Friends, it's because if we don't understand the context and the limitations here, when we get to verses 11 and 12, we're going to run into a problem. Verses 11 and 12 say that a woman is not to teach or have authority over a man. Now, some people have not properly understood the context here, and they have incorrectly concluded that a woman cannot have authority over a man under any circumstances, including the secular world. I have a book in my office in which a preacher sets forth the idea that a woman cannot have authority over a man in any area of life. He suggests that a woman cannot be a man's boss in the workplace that she cannot be in a position of authority in a governmental role, that she could not be a teacher in a secular school if, if males, if men are present. I would have to ask, what about a policewoman? You know, if this preacher were stopped by a policewoman, what would he do? Would he say, you don't have authority over me because I'm a man? Of course, if he said that, he would soon be a man in jail. <laughs> the point that we're making is you have to understand the context here and its limitations. Now, a second way in which we could abuse the context of this passage is to say that a woman cannot ever teach a man the Bible under any circumstances. Several years ago, I encountered a preacher who took the position that a woman cannot even sit down in the privacy of her own home and conduct a Bible study with her adult son. She could not even talk to her adult son about the Bible. In fact, he said if she were to do this, she would be sinning. Friends, do you see the problem here? That, that's the type of doctrines that we get into if we miss the context. We get to a point that a woman cannot even teach her own son the Bible in the privacy of her home. And this particular preacher I'm talking about, he binds that on other people. We have to keep this passage in its context, and that is the public assembly of Christians. All right, verse number 11, let's talk about this. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Now, the word translated here as silence in this passage is of great importance. The Greek word translated as silent carries with it the idea of quietness 
or quiet submissiveness. This is not the word that means absolute, total, don't utter a sound silence. Now there's another Greek word which carries that idea, but that is not the one used in this verse. If it were the word used here, then a woman could not even sing in the assembly. She could not make the good confession. She could not say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, verse number 12, And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now the word teach here is from the Greek word didasko. It means to deliver a didactic discourse. It means to instruct with moral lessons. It deals with a reasoned, developed presentation that would include reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. And basically, it's what we do when we preach. So, does this passage mean then that a woman cannot preach publicly when men are present? Yes, that is exactly what this passage means. Paul, by inspiration, wrote that a woman is not to teach in any manner in which she is going to have authority over the man. And when a person stands up to preach, Paul told Titus that an evangelist is to speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, Titus chapter 2 and verse 15. And so if a woman is not permitted to usurp authority over the man, then she is not able to carry out the work of an evangelist. Unfortunately, this is becoming something that's very common. I have met many female preachers, and it grieves me deeply that this is bleeding over into the Church of Christ. God said via Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, He said, I suffer not a woman to teach. Now this word teach means to deliver a didactic discourse, which is exactly what a person does when he preaches. So could a woman be a preacher for a congregation? Absolutely not. She cannot do that without violating this passage. All right, here's another question. Does this passage teach that a woman may not lead a public prayer or in, lead in another act of worship? Yes, it, it does teach that. Now, the American Standard translates verse 12 this way, But I permit not a woman to teach, nor to have dominion over a man, but to be in quietness. Now, that means that any public act of worship in which a woman would have dominion is forbidden. Now, that would certainly apply to leading a prayer. And you know, besides that, back in verse number 8, he has already specifically said that a male, males are to lead the prayers. Okay, here's another question. Does this passage teach that a woman cannot be an elder in the Lord's church? Yes, that's exactly what this passage teaches. You know, if a woman cannot teach and she cannot have dominion over a man, how could she possibly fulfill the duties of an elder? Hebrews 13, 17 says that Christians are to obey the elders. Christians are to submit to the elders. If a woman were in that position, it would put her in direct violation of 1 Timothy 2 and, and many other passages. And we haven't even touched on the idea that one of the qualifications of an elder is that he must be the husband of one wife. And of course, a woman is not able to meet that qualification. So a woman cannot serve as an elder. Here's another question, number four. Does this passage mean that a woman could not teach her son or her husband or, or the man next door in, in a private setting, maybe around the kitchen table, that she could not teach him the gospel? She could not teach him how to be saved? No, this passage does not teach that. Remember, the context of 1 Timothy chapter 2 is that of the public worship service. And that's not what we're considering in this question. In fact, in Acts chapter 18 and verse 26, we find that a man and his wife, their names were Aquila and Priscilla, the two of them took Apollos aside privately and they had a personal Bible study with him. And the text says they taught him the Word of God more perfectly. And so you have a man and a woman and they are sitting together with another individual and they're discussing the Bible in a private setting. And that is not what is forbidden in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Okay, let's summarize. A woman cannot be a preacher. A woman cannot serve as an elder. A woman cannot lead in the public assembly. She cannot lead a prayer or any other public act of worship. A woman cannot teach a Bible class where men are present. A woman can, however, 
teach in a private setting. She can teach children. She can teach other women in any setting. And certainly, she can teach by her example. Now, let's talk for just a minute about the reasons for these restrictions. Why has God placed these restrictions upon women? You know, one church in Nashville, Tennessee has stated that the Apostle Paul gave these restrictions for cultural reasons and that in the day and age in which we live, that they don't apply, that it would have been inappropriate at that time for a woman to teach a man, but today they would say it's different and that none of these things apply any longer. You know, some people have even gone so far to suggest that the Apostle Paul was a chauvinist and that he was just prejudiced against women. And so we need to ignore what these people are saying, and we simply need to ask the question, what does the Bible say? What does God say? Because these accusations against Paul and, and to say these are cultural only, that nothing could be further from the truth. Friends, first we need to appreciate that Paul wasn't speaking for himself. Rather, he was speaking for the Lord. He was speaking as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And secondly, as far as this being merely a cultural matter, I want you to consider with me the next two verses, verses 13 and 14, because the Lord gives us the reasons for these restrictions. Listen to it. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Friends, these restrictions have nothing to do with the local culture at the time that Paul was writing. These things go all the way back to the beginning. They relate to the order of creation and the order of deception. The man was created first and the woman was deceived first. You know, I am deeply troubled by what is taking place in the religious world around us today and I'm especially troubled when I see it bleeding over into the Church of Christ. May we always take the approach that no matter what happens in the world around us, we will hold to the Word of God. May we never be afraid to stand up for what God says about this or any matter. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. That means we must have authority from God for everything that we do in religion. God bless.